youth group, you guys have a great day. Hey, hey, youth group, make sure you tell me if those youth pastors are teaching heresy, all right? If they're teaching nonsense, you come and tell me. No chance, no chance. Our youth pastors, they're, they're amazing. They really are. Um, all right, I'm, I'm kind of debating right now. It's 747, and I want to get through uh, Jeremiah, but let, let's, let's just, I, I say quickly, and I never do quickly well. But I, I feel like I need to say something. So turn with me, if you will, really quickly to Acts chapter 2. And, and I just want to kind of address and something we've been addressing. And the reason, only reason I think I'm really addressing it is because a lot of you guys have been asking me. And, and you've probably been on social media and you've seen um, different things. I watched one on Sunday. And, and I can't tell you how many pastors and churches around the world took a break on Sunday and talked about the, the coming um, solar eclipse that was coming on Monday, and they made such a big deal out of it. And it, hey, Josh, 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 I'm really loud, brother. Is that just me or what? Turn me down a little bit, please. I'm loud enough as it is. I don't need help. Yeah. Um. So, like John Hagee, who who John Hagee has some kind of calls the guy out as a heretic, not at all. You know, he's got some some decent stuff, but you know, he just little sensational as far as my opinion is going with some of these things and, you know, really wanted to hammer down on Sunday about this um, solar eclipse being a biblical event. And, and listen, I, you know, I've been telling you guys for weeks, we're, 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 that's not what we're putting stock in. People sensationalize this stuff. They make it Bible when it's not Bible. And again, any of those guys, I'll challenge any of those guys, if they want to um, show me what chapter and show me what verse and we can unpack it and we can apply it to something that's going on. We have two places in the scriptures that I've told you guys a hundred times, I hope you know it by now, that are absolute thumbnail, you can put your thumb on it, Bible prophecy that is coming. There's coming a day when Russia and Iran and Turkey and seven other nations are going to attack Israel. Okay, what's interesting right now is Russia is moving troops um, into Syria. So that's something that's eyes wide open. That's one of the prophecies, Ezekiel 38. It's the coming prophecies of the last days that we could put our thumb on. When you open up your newspaper and it says Russia and Iran and Turkey, not Hamas, have invaded Israel, that's the sign of the end times. That, that's, a, that's an absolute chapter and verse fulfillment of Bible prophecy. It's, it's, a, it's a 27-year-old, 100-year-old prophecy that 100 years ago would have made no sense. Russia and Iran have been uh, eternal enemies since, since the conception. And today... They're all teamed up, all of these nations. What's fascinating enough about the Ezekiel 38 prophecy is the nations that are not listed. You have these perpetual enemies of Israel, like, for example, Egypt and Saudi Arabia, who are not mentioned in the battle. And you look at the, the landscape of where things are today, and, and it makes sense right now. Now, listen, if the landscape changes, we, we, we don't um, do newspaper prophecy. We don't watch world events and then try to make those world events fit into the Bible. The Bible is a straight line. It's never going to change. And if the world events are not fitting into exactly what the Bible says, we're not going to bend the Bible to try to make it work. We're going to wait. And then those things in the world, they are going to align and they are going to come exactly as the Bible foretold. The Bible says, and the other one is, somebody tell me, somebody tell me you've learned something in the 10 years I've been here. One is Ezekiel 38. What's the other one? Isaiah 17, 1. Thank you, Sean, for bailing out the rest of these folks here tonight. Isaiah 17.1 says that today where Bashar al-Assad is, is a city called Damascus, Syria, and that Damascus, Syria will be completely flattened and destroyed, okay? Those are things that we can look at, we can read, we can put our thumb on. Solar eclipses, blood moons, none of that stuff is scripture that you can put your finger on. So I want to take you to the place where some of these folks that are trying to make this into a Bible end times kind of thing. Now, listen, you know where I stand on all of these things very clearly. I believe we're living in the last days. I believe we're living in the days the Bible describes when Jesus is going to return in the rapture. I believe that could happen at any moment, that nothing else needs to happen in order for that, that event to take place. I believe that event could happen tonight. I believe it could happen in a year. I believe it could happen in five years. I don't know, but we're living in the days that, that Jesus said he's going to come back and nothing else needs to happen. Now, the verse that oftentimes they're using trying to make these, these um, current events into these sensationalized Bible prophecies, and here's the reason why I stress this stuff, is because if you, if you get into this stuff and you start watching these things, and listen, 
Seven years ago, when the last eclipse came, you know, and the way they draw these lines between the two eclipses and where they meet and all this stuff, all these this kind of details they try to bring out of it. Some of it's very interesting. Like the last one entered the United States in a city called Salem, passed over seven Salems and, and, and exited the United States in a city called Salem. Like that's pretty cool. Jerusalem, the word Salem means peace. This one was starting in what, Nineveh? Was it Nineveh's? And it went across seven Ninevehs in, in its path of totality and... And the whole thing was pretty cool, right? You guys have pictures, like I saw some from Dallas when the whole city just got black like it was night stars started coming out in the middle of the day. Like that stuff is cool. But, but it's, not, it's not something that, that is the sign or things that, that they were looking for. But here's the other thing I don't want to do. I don't want to completely discount it. I'm not completely discounting it either, okay? All of these things, this is, this is what I believe. This is what I believe the Bible teaches. Look, it says, um, Peter is in his first Christian sermon. 3,000 people are going to get saved. Um, Peter is just filled with the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2, and he preaches the first sermon. And it says in in, um, Acts chapter 2, you guys with me? Turn there with me if you haven't yet. Acts chapter 2. And Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose. The people thought they were drunk. Why did they think they were drunk? Because they were full of the Holy Spirit, and they were speaking in other tongues, and they were prophesying, and God's Holy Spirit was moving. They're like, what's wrong with these guys? People probably look at us sometimes and think we're drunk, right? Like, we're not drunk. We're full of the Holy Spirit. And, and Peter said, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So when, when is this stuff going to come to pass? Verse 17. In the last days. Okay, the day of the Lord, time of the rapture, time of Revelation chapter 6, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above, and the signs, okay, everybody underline that word signs there, please, in verse 19, in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness. Ooh. Now, now, now listen. The, again, I'm not discounting all of this. The sun did turn into darkness this week. But a solar eclipse is a scheduled event. There's been hundreds of them. There'll be more. They happen all the time. Lunar eclipses, solar eclipses. What they do speak of is that there is absolutely a God in heaven because the universe is such a precise Timex watch, a Rolex watch that every piece has to work together. There's no chance it happened by a Big Bang. There's no chance it happened by accident. We'll know exactly the second and minute and time the next solar eclipse is happening. We'll know what path it's going to go over because the universe is completely in tune. But these type of events, if it was an eclipse that, that the Bible was talking about, there's been so many eclipses in the last 2,000 years. And so what about the eclipse in 1400 and 1200 and 700? Um, and, then, and then he says, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. And they make a big deal out of that, right? With these blood moons that we've had, these four blood moons in the last year. And again, those things are really cool. We paid attention to those things. I pay attention to these eclipses and these kind of things. But I don't put stock into them that doesn't belong there. Now, what word did I ask you to underline in verse 19? Does it say, is there an S on the end of the word or not? Does the Bible say there's going to be signs, plural? Okay, so you can take these events, the, 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 the blood moons, the events, the prophesying, everything in this thing, and take it all in context, right? Don't take one piece out of it. Everything that he said, these will be signs, sun and dark, moon and blood, before the coming and great day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass, and here's the most important part of it, and the part that people responded to this day that Peter was preaching, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's the whole point, call on the name of the Lord. Get saved. So if anything, as Christians, we could say, listen, we do believe Jesus is coming back soon, and you need to be ready. You don't want to be left behind. You don't want to go through what's coming on this world. And so, but it says signs. How many of you guys, like, um, seen a spoke wheel before, a spoke rim, right? Like a 6'4 Dayton on Impala, uh, Impala on Dayton's, right? Like with, with front to back and side to side. So you have these Dayton wheels, and it's, it's a multi-spoked wheel. hundreds of spokes in this wheel, right? Listen. That, that's the way, the, the best way I can understand biblical prophecy. 
that, that each spoke is, and God is done. And really, honestly, since I've been in Twill the last 10 years, there's been some tremendous signs of the times. But, you know, I can remember in 2013 when we were having the, um, whatever was going on then, it was something major, ominous, this big thing in the stars and the sky, and the Leo was aligning with this, and this was happening, and all of these things, and, you know, it was a big deal. And, it, again, it was so interesting. You know, it got my attention. I'm like, oh, okay, this is, you know, but, but that was a sign. It was a sign. The blood moons we've had recently, those are a sign. The eclipse is a sign, but it's not the sign. And it's, it's not in your Bible as, as predicted as a particular event. It's, it's one in a big picture. And what is God doing? There's going to come a day when God is going to pour out his wrath upon this world, the Bible says. He's going to judge the world. The, the flood happened. And he told the people in the flood for 120 years, Noah preached and said, God is going to judge this world if you guys don't repent. God's going to judge this world. God's going to judge this world. And for 120 years, nobody changed and repented. And a worldwide deluge called the flood really happened, and Noah went up on a boat with him and, and, and eight people in the boat. That same type of destruction, worldwide flood, ominous, everybody on planet Earth dies except for Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their three wives. A, a, a type of judgment we've already seen precedent once in world history God says, is coming someday. And, and, and when that day comes, and nobody's going to be able to say, oh, well, I, I didn't know. God, I'm innocent. I didn't, couldn't see. There was nothing going on. There was no sign. There was no, there, it's everywhere. All you got, you got to be an ostrich with your head in the sand to not see it. You really do. Like, there's so many things going on. And, and, and here's the thing that, that, that you know, is, is all Bible, all Bible. And if you get into this, this, astronomy and the stars and leos are surrounded by the moon and the stars at our feet and all this stuff you watch on youtube listen if you follow all that stuff it's not a bible it's not a chapter it's not a verse and and it never ends and to me if i was in that world by today because i've been a christian a long time i would be so disillusioned with all that stuff like by this time, I'd be, none of it's true. It's all whack. They've been saying that stuff for so long, and every time something's happening, it's the end of the world, and Jesus is coming, and this is the day, and it's going to be in 2013. It's going to be in 2014. It's going to be the one I saw today. It's going to be in 2024. But all that does at the end of the day, it just, it just gets people skeptic and doubt. Like, it's just nonsense. No, none, none of that is a chapter and a verse. Here's what we do. If you're people of the Bible, this is what you do. You keep your eye on Israel. Because Israel is absolutely the key to Bible prophecy. It's, it's where it's all going to happen. Everything is surrounding with Israel. Not Israel, it's Israel. And then the center of Israel is Jerusalem. And the center of Jerusalem is the Temple Mount. So you keep your eye on Israel. You keep your eye on Jerusalem. You keep your eye on the Temple Mount. And when thing, that, that is the epicenter of Bible prophecy. And that is things you can put your thumb on, your finger on, and that will tell the true tale and not these things. Now, again... Last thing I'll say, and then I do, give me, let's do maybe 20, 25 minutes of Jeremiah tonight. We'll stop at 825. But um, and listen, I'm not completely discounting all this stuff. I do put it into this category, this word right here that I asked you to underline. Signs. Signs, plural. One of the spokes in the wheel. You can't have a, a, a Dayton with, with one spoke, right? Has lots of spokes, lots of different things that eventually all of these signs and wonders put together are going to fulfill. Read Matthew 24. If you're interested in this stuff, read Matthew 24. Jesus said, the disciples said, Jesus, when are you coming back? And then he started, and he talked for 35 verses. He didn't just give them, okay, when you see, a, you know, a solar eclipse, and it passes over seven Ninevehs, that's the day. He didn't say that. He, he said a bunch of stuff. So you look at all the things down the line, and you go through them that Jesus said. And like I said, Israel is the key to biblical prophecy. That's why Satan hates Israel. That's why Satan's tried to kill the Jew for 6,000 years. All right. Jeremiah, let's do it. So much good in Jeremiah. Oh, Jeremiah is just it's crazy, right? So ominous. No time to get a running start tonight. So most of you, I know you've been with us for, for through the study in Jeremiah. So we're just going to pick up where we left off. We're beginning in chapter 36. I'm not going to hit every, every verse as we go through. I'm just going to hit the highlights. But um, chapter 36 in Jeremiah, you guys there? You guys still awake? We good? I, don't forget, I got this laser tonight. I kind of want to use it. So I'm hoping one of you guys are going to fall asleep or try something, throw something at me. Um, chapter 36, verse 1 says, Now it came to pass in the fourth year of, of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, that this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. What king is there in 36? 
Verse 1. The king, what is the king's name there? Jehoiakim. We've talked about these four kings. There's four kings. Jeremiah is going to reign, or not reign, he's prophesying over a 40-year period. So we're backed up one king from the last king. So this would be the third one in the reign of, uh, not, I keep saying reign, but you know what I mean, in the, in the life and the ministry of Jeremiah, he's going to serve under these four kings. This is the third of the fourth. We're bouncing around a little bit now in the timeline. When we, when we were in a couple chapters ago, we were already in the Babylonian captivity stages, and then we're, now we're back to telling these stories about um, the third king. When we get to chapter 37, it's going to spend a section talking about the last king, Zedekiah, and his reign and his rule. That's about 18 years prior to 36. So chapter 36 is happening 18 years um, before uh, 37, and we get in that section. So this is Jehoiakim. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, and he said, Take a scroll of a book and write in it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel and Judah and against the nations. From that day I spoke to you, from the days of Josiah even to this day. Twenty-three years so far Jeremiah has been prophesying. That's why when we get to the next chapter, we're going to add 18 years. Brings us to about 40 years that Jeremiah has been in ministry by the time we get to 37. By the time we get to chapter 39, it's going to chronicle the Babylonian um, captivity and siege and really get ugly. The people are going to eat their children. They're going to be starved. It's a siege campaign that Nebuchadnezzar does in Jerusalem, and it, it just gets really ugly. And this is leading up to it. And, and so what, what's really cool, and I'm just going to kind of flesh this out a little bit. God is telling Jeremiah in this chapter I want you to write down. Now, how many of you guys can remember? Let's, let's, let's take a little survey. Somebody tell me what you had for dinner. Uh, well, not last Wednesday night because you guys were all here eating pizza. So let's go last Thursday night. Who can raise their hand and tell me what they had for dinner last Thursday night? Ken? Had a burger. All right. Ken remembers. He eats a burger every Thursday night, so that don't really count, you know. But <laughs> so the, the, the point being, you know, Jeremiah is called here to remember 23 years of the things that God has spoken to him. And um, without a doubt, as we know in the New Testament, the Bible says the Bible is written and inspired by the Holy Spirit. The idea is that there's, there's a boat and it has a sail, and the Holy Spirit is the wind that's driving this boat wherever it goes. And there's no um, pilot. It's just the, the sail, and the wind in the sail is taking the boat where it goes, that the Holy Spirit is inspiring the things of God. But what's fascinating is that Jeremiah is told in this chapter in 36 to write down. What did Jeremiah write down? Exactly what we're reading. What you have on your lap he wrote this down 2,600 years ago as inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's word for word, verbatim, as it happened, as he, he, he wrote it and remembered it and the Holy Spirit led it so that he wouldn't make errors and mistakes. You know, you know the Jews and the scribes, they didn't have copy machines, right, for so many years. So the Jews and Jewish culture and history, uh, and, and of course, one of the, the ministries and the call of God's people, the Jewish people throughout history is to preserve his word. And listen, the same God who gives us the Bible is also the same God that is able to preserve his word. You know, one of the pastors, one of my pastor friends, he says, you know, I won't serve a God that can't preserve his own word. And, and it just makes sense that God is preserving the word. And so we don't have it with Jeremiah, but in the same vein as Isaiah had a, had a 50, 50 year ministry and, and wrote 66 chapters in the Bible and, and painstakingly. So now, because they didn't have the, the, copy machine and those things they wrote everything by hand and they copied down the original from parchment to parchment and had so many rules the scribes in israel they they when they finish a scroll and, and it's a scroll from start to finish it's not like they didn't have chapters and breaks in the original bible we added those later for convenience i'm glad we did but they wouldn't write them in a scroll when jesus would have read the scroll he would have had to know to turn to the book of isaiah where it was and roll it this way and that way and then they count the characters including the spaces and there's thousands and when they're done, if there's one error, it's supposed to have, you know, 12,436 characters. And if they get 4,301 off, they throw the whole thing away. Every time they write the word, just the word Yahweh or Lord, L-O-R-D, capital L-O-R-D, the Jewish scribe culture is you write one letter, then, you, then you, you ritually bathe, you clean, you wash, you go through the ceremony, you come back, and you write one more letter, 
And then they never added the consonants in because they didn't want to um, blaspheme. They didn't want to pervert the name of God. That's why we have the YHVH because they left the consonants out. We don't know what it is. Jehovah, Yahweh, you know, whether, whether what, what it is. But the painstaking efforts that the scribes go through to, to meticulously keep the word. Now that brings us back to Isaiah that I brought up a second ago. Isaiah, we found original copies from the scribes of the book of Isaiah, the oldest manuscripts that we, we currently have written at the time 2,600 years ago to Isaiah. And what did they find in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Exactly to the letter, the Bible that you have in your lap is, is, is what it was. And so this is exciting. We, we get this little snippet where God is instructing Jeremiah here to write. And then in verse 4, it kind of tells us how he does it. It says, Jeremiah calls Baruch the son of Nerii, and Baruch wrote the scroll of a book at the instruction of Jeremiah and all the words of the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's a tetragrammaton, that's Yahweh there. So God is dictating to Jeremiah. Jeremiah is, 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 is verbalizing it. Baruch is writing it down, which he had spoken to him, all the words of the Lord, which he had spoken to him. And Jeremiah commanded Baruch saying, I am confined and I cannot go out the house into the house of the Lord. He was still in prison. You remember that about Jeremiah last week? You go, therefore, and read from the scroll which you have written at my instruction the words of the Lord, inheritance of the people of the Lord, Lord's house, in the day of fasting, and, and you shall also read them in the hearing of Judah and all who come to their cities. And then as it goes on, if, let's go to verse 20. Um, so the scroll is read, and then the kind of the enemies come, and in verse 20 it says, and when they went to the king into the court, but they stored the scroll in the chamber of Elishma, the scribe, and told all the words of the hearing of the king. So the king sent Jehudai to bring them the scroll, and he took it from Elishma. Any guys looking for Bible boy names? Don't use these ones, all right? These guys are schmucks. And the scribe's chamber, and Jehuda read it, and the hearing of the king, and all the hearing of the princes who stood beside the king. Now the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month where the burn, with the fire burning and the hearth before him. And it happened when Jehudu read three of the four columns that the king cut it with the scribe's knife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the scroll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. So how did the king react when he was reading Jeremiah's prophecies? What was Jeremiah saying? Babylon is going to come. They're going to conquer you. If you submit and you, you give yourself to this, you can survive. If you rebel against this, it's going to happen. You're not going to make it. You're going to die. They're reading so far what Jeremiah has written. And the king takes the, the, the knife of the scribe, starts cutting it, throws it in the fire, and it's all burned. Painstaking work they went through to, to create this scroll. But again, you, you can take the word of God and you can burn it. It doesn't change the truth. It's not going to change the truth. You, they couldn't destroy it. So obviously they rewrote it because we have it here. But in his first copy, the king takes it and he throws it in the, in the thing. But, you know, Jesus says in Matthew 24, where I, where I just was. Uh, oh, no, actually I didn't read Matthew. I went to, uh, we did the one in Acts instead. But in Matthew 24, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So heaven and earth will pass away and the word of God will be preserved, Jesus said. And so, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. There's a cool story of a, a pastor. He's a pastor. He was a pastor for a long time. Great ministry. And he was in college. And he was uh, he was a a foreign exchange. I think he was a foreign exchange student. He was an immigrant from um, China. And his name was um, Lo Tao Dang. I think he's from Vietnam. That's what it was. He's from Vietnam. Lo Tao Dang is Vietnamese. And people were were ministering to him. They were witnessing to him. They were sharing the gospel with him. And in his class, he says, "Well, college class would share the gospel with him." He said, "I don't want nothing to do with that. He didn't want to hear it." And, he said people, God just kept putting people in his life that were sharing the gospel with him. And somebody gave him a Bible and said, you know, we at least read the Bible. And so um, Lo Tao Dang, he goes home and there's a fireplace at his house and he takes that Bible and he's like angry and he just throws the Bible in the fire like you see here. And um, the next morning he gets up and he goes into the fireplace and the Bible had burned and there was a one little piece of the Bible that was not burned and he pulled it out of the fire and it was the verse in Matthew where Jesus says, Lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. <laughs> True story. And, and he just began to weep. And again, the, you know, the kind of the Holy Spirit was obviously calling him and drawing him. And the Holy Spirit was the one that was doing the work. And that's the, the way the Holy Spirit got a hold of his heart. But, you know, God, God was calling him. And that was what he needed. And, and at that point, he gave his life to Jesus and went on and became a pastor and 
had a pretty cool ministry, Lo Tao Dang. So, um, so Jeremiah in verse 27 rewrites the scroll, and that's, that's 36. You can go through tonight, later, read through it. I ask you guys to read ahead every week, so hopefully you're reading ahead. You've read some of this stuff. Um, in chapter 37, now we move to what King is mentioned in verse 1 of chapter 37. Zedekiah, we were just reading a story about Jehoiakim and um, Jeremiah being told to write the scriptures, the one you have on your lap. The king burned it. He rewrote it. And now we move 18 years into the future. Zedekiah is the last king that's in power. Now, I, I, some of this stuff we'll get, but let me just kind of wrap it up for you really quickly. Zedekiah was the last king. He reigned for 11 years. Jeremiah is prophesying over a 40-year period. As you guys know, we've been through this many times. Um, when Nebuchadnezzar came, he came in three waves, right? Six, 605, 586, um, five, 595, and 586, the three different sieges on Jerusalem. And so in, in this reign, Zedekiah was a king. He was a vassal king, really, because Nebuchadnezzar set him up. And Nebuchadnezzar said, like, don't rebel against me, do it. We read in the early chapters where God is speaking to this king, Zedekiah, and, and, and God, through the prophet Jeremiah, is, is warning him, don't rebel. Just, just don't rebel. If you rebel, it's not going to go well for you. And then he ends up, continues to rebel against Nebuchadnezzar and not, does, not doing what he's doing. And finally, Nebuchadnezzar makes good on his promise, and he begins a siege in about 587. And, and it's an 18-month siege because it says the siege is going to begin in the 10th year, in the ninth month, and it's going to end in the 11th year, in the fourth month. So Nebuchadnezzar comes with this siege type of warfare that they would do in those days where they would surround the city. They don't let any food in, in or out, and they starve the people out, and eventually they have to give up. And so um, Zedekiah was the king, the last king of Israel. We talked about that last week, that God said a king would never fail to sit on the throne of David, fulfilled in Jesus. But Zedekiah in history is the last king in Israel. After the 70 years of Babylonian captivity, the Israel comes out. They never again have a king. We have the 400 silent years that brings us into the New Testament. So, um, so this is Zedekiah. He's the one who his eyes were gouged out by King Nebuchadnezzar. His sons murdered in front of him in the siege. Um, Zedekiah is going to flee when, when, the, when the siege finally breaks through the walls. He's going to get all the way to Jericho, which is about 11 miles from Jerusalem to the east. And, and Nebuchadnezzar and his men are going to catch up with Zedekiah and Jericho. Um, the, and, and it doesn't say this detail, but it's most likely in, in history the Assyrian kings would do this stuff themselves. They catch Jeremiah. Um, they murder his two sons in front of him. And then they, they, they take out his eyes so that the last thing he sees is his sons dying. Um, Ezekiel, who's also prophesying in our Bibles in the same time as Jeremiah, had what, what some would say is a, is a contradicting prophecy. We've covered that because Ezekiel says you're, you're never going to get, um, you're never going to see Babylon. And Jeremiah is telling him all the way that you're going to Babylon if you're going to be in captivity there. Well, they end up both being true because he goes to Babylon, but he never sees it because the king, because um, Nebuchadnezzar took out his eyes. So we have this story in verse chapter 37. It says, Now King Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, reigned instead of Kaniah, the son of Jehoiakim, who Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made king in the land of Judah. But neither he or his servants, nor the people of the land, gave heed to the words of the Lord, which he spoke by the prophet Jeremiah. And Zedekiah the king sent Jehoiakim, the son of Shelmiah, and Zephaniah, the son of Masai, the priest to the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Pray now to the Lord God for us, Lord our God for us. And now Jeremiah was coming and going among the people, for they had not yet put him in prison. Then Pharaoh's army came up from Egypt, and when the Chaldeans who were who were besieging Jerusalem heard news of them, they departed from Jerusalem. So there's a little wrinkle here. I think I've talked about it before. I want you to remember it as we go through this narrative of exactly what happened in this, this point in Israel's history. But Babylon is coming. And you remember all the false prophets are saying, no, Babylon is going to win or we're going to beat Babylon. Remember when uh, Jeremiah made that yoke and, and he told God's people, this is the yoke that's going to be around you. And the, the false prophets took Jeremiah's yoke off of his neck and they threw it on the ground and it broke. And they said, God's going to break the Babylonian yoke over us and God's going to win. And, and so in the sea, Season, the, the Babylonian army is called back and they have to go fight because Egypt is, is, is warring against them. And so they go to fight Egypt. And then the, the false prophets and the people of Israel, they're rejoicing. They're waving their fingers in Jeremiah's face. They're actually going to throw him in prison. They're going to say, see, we told you Babylon's not going to conquer us. And the Egyptians are going to beat them in this battle. And 
it's not true what you're saying. And then the Egyptians end up, the Babylonians obviously beat the Egyptians in this fight. And then the Babylonians will come back and do exactly what God's word said they would do. And so that's that little wrinkle that's going on. And in verse 6, it says, The word of the Lord came to the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, that you shall say to the king of Judah who sent you to me to inquire of me, Behold, Pharaoh's army, which has come to help you, will return to Egypt to their own land. And the Chaldeans shall come back and fight against the city and take it and burn it with fire. Thus says the Lord, Do not deceive yourself, saying the Chaldeans will surely depart from us, for they, for they will not depart. For though you had defeated the whole army of the Chaldeans who fight against you, and there remain wounded among them, every man is tent and burn the city with fire. So God is just saying it's not going to happen. And then in verse um, 11 through the end of the chapter, Jeremiah is going to be put in prison. And, and basically they say, oh, you're going to defect. You're going to go um, defect to the Chaldeans. And, and, and Jeremiah is like, I'm not going anywhere. But they said, oh, we don't trust you. You know, you're a traitor. And right now the the, the political landscape is kind of in their favor because the Babylonians are in this war with Egypt and not them, and there's this little peace time, and so they take Jeremiah, and of course, you know, not, not just one. Jeremiah had so many enemies. You remember in the early chapters, it said that even his brothers and his family were his enemies, and so they take him and they put him in the prison. He had been in prison um, in the king's house, and now they're going to throw him in, like in the dungeon, and then in chapter 38, it's kind of more of the same narrative as we pick up there in 38, and it says, um, you guys want to read these names for me? <laughs> I'll skip them. Now, Sephatiah, who named, who, 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 you know, I think some of these Utah names are kind of funny, you know, but they don't got nothing on these guys. I don't know who wakes up or who has their, their uh, reveal, reveal party and says, I know what we're going to name him, Sephatiah. And the son, Matan, and Gedaliah, the son of Pasher, Jukal. You know, you know, I'll just say one thing about all these names in the Old Testament. Like, th these, are, these are real people. Like, this is not, you know, the things that fairy tales are made of. This is real history, real names, real people. One of the things that makes the Bible so authentic, that, that it's giving the names of these people, and you find these people in, in the annals of history. They're archaeologically, they're historically proven. And it says, heard the word that Jeremiah had spoken to all the people, saying, thus says the Lord, he who remains in this city shall die by the sword. So what is Jeremiah saying? If you remain in the city, what's going to happen? You're going to die by the sword, by famine, by pestilence. And he who goes over to the Chaldeans shall live. The Chaldeans, another word for just Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar and his crew, his life shall be as a prize to him and he shall live. Thus says the Lord, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. Therefore, the princes said to the king, please let this man put to, be put to death. They're talking about Jeremiah. Just kill him. We're tired of him. He's weakening the army. He, he's, he's killing the morale in Israel. He's prophesying these, these that we're not going to win. And, and then again, at the same time, all the false prophets are coming around, giving false prophecies. That's exactly what we have in the world today, right? You got tons of people out there giving false lies about God and false prophecies. And, you know, it's got the word of God has to has to back it up. If it's not backed up in the word of God, the Bible says, test those prophets, test those things. And the word of God was saying one thing, and, and, and yet all these people were raising up around the people of Israel and, and, and prophesying lies. And then in verse 4, the prince said to the king, please let this man be put to death. For thus he weakens the hands of the men of war who remain in this city in the hands of all the people by speaking words to them. For this man does not seek their welfare of the people, but their harm. And then Zedekiah the king said, look, he's in your hands, for the king can do nothing against you. So they took Jeremiah and cast him in the dungeon of Malchiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the prison. And there they let Jeremiah down with ropes. And in the dungeon, there was no water, but Jeremiah sank in the mire. So it's just, it's just this dungeon, like literal dungeon that doesn't even have an access to it, that they literally have to wrap ropes around Jeremiah and lower him into the dungeon. Now, now we know the life and the ministry of Jeremiah. So again, you know, anybody who says to you, you know, God's will for your life is happy, healthy, wealthy. And if, you know, you don't have two Cadillacs, then give me yours and I'll have three. And, you know, all this nonsense that, that, that there's prosperity. Now there's joy in the Lord. And, and, and the Jeremiah has already come to this point. You remember in chapter 20, Jeremiah had been going through these types of things. So here's a guy who's done nothing but live his life exactly as God has called him to live it. And, and does that mean his life is Disneyland every day and everything's great and he's not going to face anything? You, you, know, you know the 12, 12 apostles besides you know, Judas, obviously, even the 11? Every one of them except for John died a brutal death. Very brutal, 
brutal, violent death. They gained nothing from it. And every one of them took the, the fact that Jesus rose again to their grave, and none of them recanted. If it was a lie, not 11 men wouldn't have died for that. But, but here Jeremiah, he, he, he and you know, because I think sometimes, right, if we end up in the mire as he's in in this chapter, we can say to ourselves, oh, it's because of, of sin in my life, or I'm, I'm, you know, God's judging me, and, and these kind of things. But it doesn't mean have to be. Like, there's a consequence for sin, no doubt. But at the same time, God has a guy who's doing exactly. In chapter 20, Jeremiah was just over it. He was struggling. He's like, oh, Lord, I've done everything you've asked me to do. I've walked exactly according to your will, and, and, and I'm done. I'm done, Lord. I'm not going to speak another name, another word in your name. I'm not prophesying for you anymore. I'm done. Find somebody else. And then the next verse is one of the greatest verses in all the Bible, right? And Jeremiah says, but the word of the Lord burned in my heart like a fire, and I could not but withhold it. It, it really is, is that passion that, and that's what you have to have to preach, to be, to be in ministry, to have the gospel. It's like, you have to have that. It has to really be like, you can't do nothing else. You know, I don't mean that, you know, I couldn't figure out another job, but I don't want to do nothing else. I couldn't do nothing else. I, you know, my desire is only to serve the Lord and, 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 and teach and preach his word. And so, Jeremiah is here in the mire. You get a little bit of Jeremiah's flesh through some of this where he does struggle like you and I would with doubts, like, hey, God, what's going on? And so you see a little bit of that. It's not like he's this super giant of faith and he's just like, yeah, I'm in the mud, but I'm doing God's will and I got so much joy here and God's so good. Like he's feeling the same way we would feel in the situation, like, Lord, what's going on here? And in verse 7, it says, now Ebed Melech. Now this guy's a really cool guy. He was the Ethiopian of one of the eunuchs who was the king's house. Heard they, they were... They had put Jeremiah in the dungeon when the king was sitting at the gate of Benjamin. So the eunuchs in the Bible, they, they were castrated, and they would usually be like over the king's harem. They, they were men that, that um, you know, the king would, would, would trust with, with the women watching the harem. He would trust them with not wanting to kill him because they don't have somebody. They're trying to take the kingdom and pass it on to him. So it was a culture in the day that, that, that the men around the king and the king's guard would be made eunuchs, and they, and they would serve. But they were also, they, they weren't you know, weak men. These, these were the toughest fighting men that, that, the, that they knew of their day. He didn't mess with a, with a eunuch and his sword. I mean, he stood by the king. He guarded the king's women. He did the king's business. He was a, one of the most elite trained fighting men in, in all of history. So, so this is one of these guys. He's this eunuch who's a, a serving the king, and he's around the king, and he's from Ethiopia, and, and he just ha he's just a person of integrity. And so he's even putting his own life on the line. And again, this guy was, was, you know, he was bad to the bone. He was a man's man, and, you know, he wasn't taking, he was going to gonna challenge all these guys. And, and so it says, who was in the king's house, in verse 7, he heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon. And when the king was sitting in the gate of Benjamin, and Edith, Ebed Melech went out to the king's house and spoke to the king. Now, as you guys know, again, in these stories in biblical times, like you don't just approach the king, you have to be summoned. And if you, if you approach a king unsummoned, he can have you put to death by law. And so this guy comes straight to the king, and he says, My lord, the king, these men have done evil. And he's calling out these guys, all these men that came to, to, to Zedekiah, who's this spineless king in Israel, um, who says, Oh, okay, I don't know. Take Jeremiah and do what you want with him. They take him. They throw him in the prison. Well, this ebed Melech, he's going to step up, and he say, Hold on. Something's, this is wrong. So he goes to the king, and he said, These men have done evil. And all they have done to Jeremiah, the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon... And he is likely to die from hunger in the place where he is, for there is no more bread in the city. And then the king commanded ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, saying, Take from here 30 men with you and, and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he dies. So, so now the king, again, he's, he's convicted. He knows it's wrong. He knows this guy is right. And he says, Take 30 men with you. There was men that were on the other side of this who had put Jeremiah into this dungeon and into the mire. And um, basically when it says he was in the mire, literally... The, 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 the dungeon that was lowered down into rope was, was a mud pit, and Jeremiah would have sunk down into the mud. Josephus tells us that, that, that it's believed that Jeremiah was in mud up to his neck, and then they, they put this stone over the entrance so it was in total darkness. No water, no bread, and when you're in total darkness and you're sunk in mud, I mean, first of all, your mind goes crazy, like solitary confinement completely drives men mad. You, you begin to lose consciousness of, of day and night and, and you just completely go crazy. So Jeremiah, this is the condition that he's in and this guy comes, this guy's going to rescue him and so finally Zedekiah says, okay, but take 30 men, these other guys are there, who knows what's going to go down and 
And Ebed took the men with him and went into the house of the king under the treasury and took from there old clothes and old rags and let them down by ropes and into the dungeon of Jeremiah. So the first thing he did was he went to the thrift store and he got a bunch of old clothes. He got some old suits, really did. And it says, then Ebed... Melech, the Ethiopian, said to Jeremiah, please put these old clothes and rags under your armpits and under the ropes, and Jeremiah did so, because he knew that he had to pull them out of this mud. They couldn't get down in it with him, so he throws these, or he doesn't say he throws them, he lowers them with the rope, and, and he's just kind. Like, the guy is just kind. He's just a nice guy. Like, he's, he's a man's man. He's tough. He's, you know, he, he's lacking some parts, but he's still a tough guy, and a man's man, and and yet he's so kind, and he's thoughtful. Like, he could have just went down, like, oh, we're going to get this guy out of there. But he stops by the thrift store first, comes up with this plan, like, how to get Jeremiah out of this hole, th- lowers these clothes down, tells Jeremiah, put, put the old garments under your arms, and I'm going to lower you a rope, and then wrap the, the rope under your arms, and when we pull you up, it's not going to rip you and cut you, and it'll, it'll help. So that's what Jeremiah does. And verse 13 says, so they pulled Jeremiah up with the ropes and lifted him out of the dungeon, and Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. So he didn't get completely out, but he got um, out of the prison, but he got out of the mire. A uh, couple more minutes. I'll try, I won't read every verse, but we're going to jam through a little bit more of this. It says in verse 14, it says, Then Zedekiah the king sent and had Jeremiah the prophet brought to him at the third entrance of the house of the Lord. And the king said to Jeremiah, I will ask you something. Hide nothing from me. And Jeremiah said to him, If I declare it to you, you will not surely put me to, you will, will you not surely put me to death? And if I give you advice, you won't listen anyway. So Jeremiah's like, forget you, dude. He's like, first of all, you're going to turn on me. When I tell you what the Lord says, you're not going to like it, so you're going to have me put to death. And, and you're not going to listen anyways. You listen, there, there's a wisdom. There's a biblical wisdom. Jesus mentions it. It's mentioned in the Proverbs. The Proverbs says, do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine. And sometimes we have discernment as Christians. When you're talking to somebody about God, you're, 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 you're arguing. You're not getting anywhere. No information is being exchanged. And, and Jesus said, we, we don't need to, Christians, we don't need to engage in those conversations. We're supposed to love people. We're supposed to be patient with them. And no, if somebody has, you know, because people come to me all the time with questions. And sometimes I can tell they just want to argue and they, they don't want to learn. They, they've come with a they already preconceived idea and how they're going to unpack it. Like, I don't got any time for them. I don't, I don't want to talk to them. I don't lose any sleep at all. I didn't witness to them and share Jesus. Like, the, their heart is, is, is hard and, and, and it's, they're not going to listen anyways. So Jesus said, you don't have to do that. Don't cast your pearl before swine. So Jeremiah's like, I'm not going to waste my time. You're not going to listen anyways. Um, so Zedekiah the king swore secretly to Jeremiah. So now he's doing this all in secret, by the way. He's like, okay, but don't tell any Jeremiah. I want you to talk to me. And he wants to know. He doesn't have any point. He doesn't, it's crazy, right? This is where the world is. They, they want to know things about the Bible. They want to know what the Bible says about the future, but they don't really have any plans on changing and or, or really listening. You know, Jesus said, James says, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. You know, Jesus said that, that the wise man heard the word, the, the man who builds his house on the rock is like the wise man who heard the word of God and he listened, he did something. And the fool is like the man who heard the word of God and he built his house on the sand. And when the winds and the rains come, the man's house who's built on the foundation falls and or, or stands and the one who built on the sand sinks. And the difference was those, the, they both heard the word of God but one person applied the word of God. And so, so the, the Bible is consistent all the way through about that we're called to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. And so this is the idea, but Zedekiah is going to push Jeremiah a little bit and he's going to be like, oh, I won't put you to death and I promise I won't, you know, I'll take care of you. And, you know, but you can't tell anybody that you're telling me this stuff and I'm coming to you because when the other people hear it and the false prophets hear it, they're going to be upset with me. So in verse 17, Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, thus says the Lord God of Israel. So now he's going to tell him what the Lord said and he's not messing around. If you, sh- if you surely surrender to the king of Babylon, princes, then your soul shall live. This city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall not live. But if you do not surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then this city shall be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and you shall not escape from their hand. Now, now Zedekiah, again, is with any leader. Zedekiah is making decisions, but they're not just going to affect him. Many people people are dying because of this decision that Jeremiah is going to make not to listen. And, and, and God is telling Zedekiah, the king, this is coming. And you can spare your life. You can spare the city. You can spare the people's lives. If you submit yourself to this judgment, like God speaks to our heart about something, right? 
And, and we know it's coming, and we're like, oh, I don't want to listen to that. I'm not going to do it. And, and, and we ignore the word of God. We ignore the warnings. And, and by doing that, we just make it worse because it's going to come. The next time it's harsher, the next time it's harsher. And so he, he's, you know, he, he's, he's going to know the word of the Lord. We know how the outcome is going to come. He's not going to listen. You know, like I said, it's, it's, it's one thing to know the word of God. It's another thing to hear the word of God and obey what it says. And it says um, in verse 18, or verse, verse 19, And Zedekiah the king said to Jeremiah, Listen to this excuse. I am afraid of the Jews who have defected to the Chaldeans, unless they deliver me into their hand and they abuse me. Anybody have a King James? Who's reading the King James? What does it say instead of abuse? My Bible says abuse me at the end of verse 19. What does yours say? Mock, right. That's a better word there, the King James. Or it says mock. So he's like, he's like they're going to make fun of me. <laughs> they're, if, if I listen to you, they're going to tease me. This is his reason not to, not to do what God's telling him to do that's going to save the lives of himself, his sons. I mean, in a short time, Nebuchadnezzar is going to murder his sons in front of him and pull his eyes out. He can avoid all that. God's telling him, you can avoid this. I'm warning you. Like, this, this is coming. And he says, oh, I don't want to do it because they're going to mock me. They're going to make fun of me. They're going to tease me. They're going to tease me at work when I show up with a Bible or I tell them I'm going to church. And, you know, the guys are going to make fun of me. And, you know, they're not going to hang out with me. Listen, who cares? The Bible says that, that if, you, if you're in Christ, the world's not supposed to love you. You're not supposed to be the most popular guy in the room. You're not around the world and around these things. If you are, that's a bigger problem. You should stand out in a good way, in a loving way, in, in, in a normal way. But you, you're going to be you're going to be mocked. It's okay. What you stand for is life changing. What you stand for is eternity. What you stand for is going to bring joy in your life and those around you. And there's eternal rewards. And then you know, and then when you, when you're with your family, when you're with your Christian family, those things none of those things matter. And yeah, the, we're not we're not going to fit in perfectly in your guys' jobs, in your life, when you're around secular people all the time. You know, n- n- again, listen, I, I'm not telling you don't don't be that Christian who who spends your whole day you know reading your Bible and telling everybody about Jesus all day. Like your work doesn't pay you to read your Bible and tell everybody about Jesus all day. They pay you to do a job, do your stinging job, right? Like. Th- that's that's Christian integrity. Like work hard, be the hardest working guy, show up first, lead last, pay your taxes, you know, set an example, work hard. And when God gives you opportunities on your lunch break and who you are, and when people come around and they start telling nasty jokes, y- you don't need to shame anybody. You just get up quietly and walk away. It's happened to have done a million times. You know, and I, oh, you guys are a bunch of losers. Man. I'm like, I just, hey, just walk away. And eventually they'll get the eye. They'll get it. Like, nah, just not, it's not who I am. I'm not doing it. I'm not sitting around listening to your dirty jokes. Because then I'll go home and tell my kids because they're probably funny and I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, like, you, seriously, you put that stuff in your mind, it just never comes out. Like, you know, I can't remember Bible verses, but honestly, I was 11 years old and this neighbor kid, his name was Larry Souter, taught me this little nursery rhyme, a little dirty nursery rhyme. To this day, 50 years old, I, from 11 years old, I, I still remember that. It'd be, I could go 10 years and not remember it, think about it, or quote it. The one of two Irishmen, two Irishmen were digging in a ditch, one called the other. That, that's all I can say, <laughs> you know. It's not, it's just not terrible. It's not like really nasty, but it's got a few little things in it. But I can still remember it, and yet I can't remember scripture. But those things stick in your mind. But here's the point. Like, I'm getting off. I'm sorry. I'm getting rabbit trailed, and we got to be done. Um, he, he's not, he's not going to listen to the Lord because they're going to mock him. They're going to abuse him. They're going to make fun of him. It's going to hurt. It's going to be personal. And, and the excuses that people use, and, and there's no excuse, right? When you stand before Jesus one day, and the Bible says, Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. Scary. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. It says, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. J- Romans 1.1.6 says, I, I'm unashamed of the gospel because it is the power of salvation to those who believe. And so we can't, we can't be ashamed. Let's just stop there. I'm going to make a little mark here in my Bible. We'll pick up there. Um, it gets really good through here. Um, actually, the rest of this is, re- read ahead, read the rest of 38. When we get to 39 is when the, when the uh, but we're wrapping down. The Babylonians um, are going to show up. It's going to get ugly. They're going into captivity. Um, read ahead, read a couple chapters ahead. We'll pick up there next week. Let's pray.
Father God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, so much for this day. God, I, I, for me, Lord, what, what really spoke to me today as I was studying for this and preparing was this chapter 36 about how, how Jeremiah was instructed, Lord, to write these things down. And the things that, that, that Jeremiah wrote down in Jerusalem 2,600 years ago, today I'm reading them. Today we have sitting on our lap exactly as Jeremiah wrote him. And Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that you've preserved your word, that your word is reliable, it's accurate, Lord Jesus, it's trustworthy, and that you're a God who can preserve your word. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. And we thank you that the word of God changes our lives. And Lord, as we study the Old Testament, these, these events, the true events that happened so long ago, and yet, Lord, your word is so powerful that we, we're applying them to our lives today as Christ followers. And so, Lord, we thank you, we love you, we praise you, and we just ask for uh, you to work in each one of our hearts and lives. And, and Lord, we ask for your blessing over us and our families. And uh, Lord, use us and help us, Lord, to figure out the workplace and Lord, how, to, how to live in this world and not be a part of this world. And, and Lord, also have, have a way to do it where we can reach the world and be light, be salt and light and love people in Jesus' name and not, not affirm their sins and not, not confirm their sins. And um, Lord, we, we just ask that you, you'd help us to walk that fine line of love and righteousness. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.